You're listening to the Converging Paths podcast, brought to you by Asia House and the Barakat Trust, with the support of the Al Tajir Trust and the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Hello, everybody. This is your host, Juan de Lara, Culture Manager at Asia House. I hope all of you are doing well, keeping yourself busy, cooking some Egyptian tamaya, or enjoying a walk at the park. And if you're in London, I hope that you're experiencing what appears to be the first days of spring. Today, I have an exciting topic with a dynamic author who is passionate about art history. This is Professor Wendy Shaw. Wendy teaches art history of Islamic cultures at the Free University in Berlin. Her works focuses on the impact of coloniality on art-related institutions, modern art, and pre-modern discourses of perception with emphasis on the Ottoman Empire. She's the author of a recently published book, What is Islamic Art Between Religion and Perception, where she has addressed and discussed how the religious aspect of Islamic art, that is its association with Islam, is often neglected or goes by unmentioned. Thus, she's reclaiming in this publication that emotional layer often missed in academia. Today, I'm here with her to discuss the importance of art history as a formal academic discipline, but also what it means at a practical level, particularly in a moment in history where culture is being under threat, because as you might know, perhaps two thirds of the cultural positions in London or in the US have been completely cut off from the job market. So welcome, Wendy. It's lovely talking to you. Well, thank you for inviting me. So I think my first question to you and the core question of this discussion is why is art history important and relevant to us today? And as an art historian, I think I, I myself feel that I could have had perhaps a more positive impact if I had devoted my time and my studies to being a doctor or a lawyer. Do you think, would you agree with this? Okay, there's so many aspects to that. First of all, You said I'm passionate about art history. I wouldn't say I'm passionate about art history so much as I'm passionate about the world and art history is a tool through which to engage it. So when you're talking about things like medicine, engineering, being a lawyer, all of these things are obviously important, right? However, the things that make it valuable to have life are not contained by the things that correct the problems in life. Right. That is, if you're thinking about those, what do you do when you're sick? You go to a doctor. If everybody was healthy all the time, you know, but you want to have something to do once you're healthy. Right. So the arts are the things that we do while we're healthy. Now, there is a corrective aspect to art history, and I'll talk about that. It's really important to me. So, yes, then it's relevant to ask you, what is art history then? Art history is a pretty modern practice. It traces its own history in various ways, but the way people practice art history in the contemporary world really goes back at latest to the 18th century, really to the 19th century. So it's very much part of modernity. During the formation of a new class called the bourgeoisie after the French Revolution, and it served the needs of modernity. So what do I mean by that? Art historical practices are a way of thinking about and categorizing the physical world that we live in. So some things are thought of, say, as art. But art history isn't just about studying a grouping of objects that are important and beautiful and valuable by some measure. It also is a series of practices that teaches us how to interpret, well, primarily what we see, but also our encounter with the world through the senses in a broader sense. And so if you walk around a city with an art historian, they're not going to just say, oh, that building's pretty. Most of the time they're going to say, oh, what an interesting combination of ancient Greek with 18th century redone in, with a contemporary thought about the 1980s writer of whoever, right? So you gain a way of looking at the world in which you're seeing all these references in their cultural complexity. And, you know, that could be somebody's ponytail, that could be their yoga pants, that could be, uh, you know, you're not just taking in this visual information, which we all do all the time. You gain the tools through which you can articulate it and really think about 
how our visuality produces meaning in the world. Since in the contemporary world, we produce so much that is visual, this is a really important skill to have if we're going to understand just simply what's going around, on around us, what's going on on Instagram. You know, we're doing this every day. What is a selfie? Why would you want to do that? <laughs> so what's going on with a selfie? And how would you relate it to art history? Now, the thing is with selfies, of course, it's associated with youth culture, right? And I have a sneaking suspicion that when people are making selfies, they look like they're celebrating their beautiful, perfect lives. But actually the disjunction between the what they're supposed to be and their fulfilling of what they're supposed to be that's enacted in the selfie and their real complex, insecure, fragmented realities. Now, why do I think that may be true? And obviously I'm saying maybe, because if it wasn't true, taking one selfie would be plenty. But instead, there are lots of selfies. You have to redo the act. There's this repetition that's part of the selfie culture, right? And to me, this repetition is, look, I am good enough. Look, I am good enough, which means to me that people are actually feeling like maybe that's not the case. So what concerns me in all this is when I go into my classroom and my students don't know each other's names and they talk to me as their teacher more easily than they often talk to each other, uh, there's something in which people are isolating themselves more and more, which means that they are more prone to listening to external authorities. It means they are less likely to find solidarity with their peers. It means that people get so nervous about themselves that it becomes very difficult to engage with the outside world And it ends up with a very weird, restrictive society in which you're always running after some sort of correctness. So how, what does art history have to do with that? You start seeing it. You start seeing it more. And you also start seeing, okay, how have people in other times and places framed themselves in a relationship with the world and in a relationships with each other? Because a lot of our communication doesn't just happen in texts. A lot of our communication happens in our visual forms. Who has the authority to make these forms? Now that we each have the authority to make these forms, where are we kind of making the same forms? The questions that we're able to ask about the visual, they're not really about art history, but they are about the tools that you get by doing a lot of visual analysis. Now, there's some parts of art history. There are lots of ways of practicing art history. And There are some aspects of art history that are really interested in conserving these wider social values. For a lot of critical art historians, which is more the kind of art history that I practice, because art history has developed as a way of maintaining values, it also is a really great way of seeing what those values are and thinking about how they could be otherwise. So One of the things that really attracts me to art history is actually like being a doctor. It's saying, look, you're claiming these sort of things for society, but actually the values you hold are embodied in these kinds of institutions and these intellectual practices. So what does art history can bring to us? And you before you sort of mentioned that it's a device, it's a tool to discover more about the world and about its narratives. The world is full of narratives. And the question is, how do we sort through these narratives? I think that instead of thinking about art objects as special things with auras in museums, we need to think about art history as a skill set of interpretation, which like literary studies, like history, like um, media studies, is part of a larger toolbox of interpreting information. So, and the reason art history stands out, say, from media studies is that frequently uh, aspects of the media that we think, find attractive, such as photographs, such as scenes in movies, these recall famous artworks. So knowing those famous artworks allows us to understand 
the vocabulary that we may not consciously recognize, but that we respond to when we're encountering the media. Very similarly, I think that one should have a critical approach to music history, partially because our world is full of music and we're hearing music all the time in movies, in advertising, and perhaps even more than visual sources. This music addresses our subconscious associations. So if we see a certain figure with a certain kind of music, we know that they are good or bad, for example. If you don't want to be manipulated by these uses, you better be aware of it in the same way as you're like, oh, I can't stand the violins in that romantic music movie. They want me to cry. And then you cry anyway. Okay, so art history is a subject that resonates at a personal, psychological an educational level. Um, to what what is what is your relationship, your approach to art history? Then, if you ask about my approach to art history, uh, I trained as an Islamic art historian, which at the time that I was studying in the 1990s generally meant studying the period before 1800. But I became very interested in critical theory that was very in fashion at the time which was post-colonial theory. And what was interesting about that to me was that it provided a way of recognizing that everything that we think about in history has actually been packaged in a particular format. So we're never actually getting what happened, we're getting what people said happened, right? So we have an intermediary. And so I became really interested in thinking about the art history of the 19th and 20th century as a frame for the past. So my first work was about the history of museums, and this has been a huge aspect of critical art history since the 1990s. I later looked at modern art of the non-Western world, specifically the Ottoman Empire. And then I realized that the entire history of Islamic art had been framed through this lens of modernity, through the categories of modernity. And so my most recent work is thinking about how can I think about what it means to be in the world that is getting rid of words like art and history and even Islam, but instead thinking about what would it be like to be somebody, say, in the 14th century who'd experienced the world in certain ways through certain poetry, who just thought, this is the world and this is how I am, just like I feel like I am now. And how can I think about that through the texts that they gave me rather than thinking about it through modern ideas? So I've really shifted a lot in my thinking, um, which doesn't mean I'm getting rid of all of art history. I can't get rid of all of art history because people know the Mona Lisa. I can't undo the Mona Lisa being important. That is, that's, it's, Mona Lisa may not be the most important painting in the world, but the fact that people know it makes it important. So even though I'm an Islamic art historian, I'm constantly engaging with this legacy of European art history that frames what I do. I'm also thinking about how this frame, such as what we call Islamic, is not just bounded by, but also interacting with other cultural and religious frames, how it interacts with Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism and so on. So then I need to ask you a fundamental question, which is what is Islamic art, which is the title of your book. And I am actually curious to know how does society relates to it, like us nowadays. Okay, so what is Islamic art, right? So traditionally it has been the study of objects that come from regions in which Islam has been a majority religion. If a person is in a museum and they go to an exhibit of Islamic art, they generally, I think, will expect to see certain things. First of all, they will expect that it will have something to do with Islam, which they may or may not know a lot about. Second, they probably will have an idea, maybe, that there won't be a lot of pictures and that they might know that there will be geometry and they might know that there will be calligraphy. They'll be writing. 
Now, if you ask an Islamic art historian about Islam, most of them will say, we don't really work on religion, we work on culture. Now that's something that's starting to change and I'm among the scholars who are trying to change that, but that has been the dominant approach of art history in general in the 20th century. So in the 20th century, the idea was that knowledge is something that's secular and religion is something that's privatized. So an art historian of European art looks at an altarpiece and sees a painting, whereas a worshiper sees something to worship, right? So this is a shift that's beyond just Islamic art history. In the 1980s and 90s, many scholars were very, found very important, and I agree with this, to recognize that there are a lot of non-Muslims in these regions, including Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, Buddhists, and Hindus at different times. And Islamic art has always been in interaction with these uh, cultures, and those cultures have also participated in the arts that are called Islamic. Part of this preconception, and this happens in the museum when you go into a section that says Islamic and it's kind of bounded off, is that it's not connected to everything else. Now, when Islamic art history was first emerging, they actually thought of it as being like the missing link between antiquity and the medieval period. But it was a missing link in a really weird way, which is that they assumed that Islamic thinkers only thought about Islam and that the antique texts, which had been translated into Arabic and which came to Europe in the 12th and 13th century had just been stored in Arabic. And then when they got translated into Latin, they were used for the first time in the Christian world. The thing is, that's extremely inaccurate. And the early Islamic world was very much part of its contemporary cultures. And it was particularly part of the continuation of late antique Platonic thought, which had been rejected by Christianity. So what does that entail? Is this a huge misconception or preconception on the study of Islamic art? So you asked me about main preconceptions. Well, one of them is that Plato is the father of Western philosophy. Nobody read anything Platonic in Europe between the time that Platonism was rejected in 529 and the time that it was re-entered European thought under scholasticism in the 12th, 13th centuries. Nobody cared about Plato. In contrast, the Platonic thinkers who had been ejected from the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire in the 6th century had gone to Sasanian Iran, and there, there were scholars who were translating their thought into the language that was used in Iran at the time, which is called Pahlavi. That area soon became part of the Islamic world, and those texts were translated into Arabic at the exact same time that this thing called Islam was developing. And so Platonism was part and parcel of the development of Islam. And so this idea that it's something that's foreign and separate is undermined by the, by the different trajectories in which antique philosophy has played an enormous role, both in the so-called Western tradition and in the Islamic tradition. So that's one, I think, huge misconception. Another huge, huge misconception is that there are no images in Islam. So if you see an image, it must be breaking the rules. So let me start with, there is no universal image prohibition in Islam. A universal image prohibition would be that would, a universal image prohibition would require that there be some text or authority that's true in all time and in all places that says no images. The only possibility for this in the Islamic world is the text that is absolute, which is the Quran. And the Quran says nothing about images. Now, there are sayings of the prophet, which are called hadith, which relate to events that involve things using images. So people who make images, images on fabric, and so on. 
And Islamic law is such that it emerges out of a debate of these statements. So you only have Islamic law if people have taken up the Hadith, kind of activated them and had discussions about them. But that didn't really happen very much in the Islamic world. There are instances of scholars saying, expressing concerns about images. There are actually more examples of scholars expressing concerns about music than about images. And there aren't a lot of cases of persecutions. There are periodic and regional prohibitions. There is periodic um, destruction of images, but often that's related to political issues. It doesn't compare in scale at all to the Christian destruction of images at the end of the Roman Empire. Um, so the issue is very complex in short. Now, the idea of this universal prohibition, that's an invention of modern scholarship. So regarding the representation of the Prophet Muhammad, there are many manuscript representations of the Prophet Muhammad. He's just a dude. He's an important dude. He's a nice dude. He's the perfect dude, but he's human. He is not Christ. If you're going to think in Christian terms, the equivalent to the divinity of Jesus is the Quran. In Islam, Moses, Jesus, Solomon, Muhammad, they're all prophets, and they are humans who are special because they're chosen by God. So depicting the prophet is something that happened, but it doesn't happen in situations of worship because you are not worshiping the prophet. You are listening to the word of God as given through prophecy to the prophet Muhammad. So your primary organ of engagement with the divine is not the eye, but the ear. Now, you can use the eye, but that's not about focusing on Muhammad. Now, there are pictures of Muhammad, but later on, images of Muhammad started to be depicted with him having a veil over his face. And even later, there were only textual descriptions. This emerges not out of a prohibition, but out of a concern that if people pay too much attention to the physical beauty of this perfect man, then they will get deceived and they will forget to worship the true divine word that he's putting forward. And so jumping to the cartoon controversies, I think that people need to pay a lot of attention to how the cartoons recycle a lot of the imagery of anti-Semitic cartoons from the early 20th century and really think about what the motivations for circulating these images are within Europe. And that's not to excuse any violence. Any violence is absolutely inexcusable. However, when people are objecting to these cartoons, they're generally saying they're insulting the prophet. They're not saying they're depicting the prophet because technically we have no clue what the prophet looked like. So you can't depict him. There's no correct depiction. But what they are doing is they're, they're caricatures of Arabs and they're caricatures of Muslims. And the, many of these caricatures are very reminiscent of similar caricatures from the early 20th century. So there's a weird combination of they prohibit images, therefore I should have a right to show this image. And you know there are multiple, multiple problems that are embedded in that. So which is in your view the best strategy to then address all these misconceptions? on issues arising from Islamic art and our perception and relationship with Islamic art? When people are thinking about communicating in a museum of Islamic art, frequently they're coming from a point in which they're thinking about the visitors, not only as not knowing very much about the Islamic world, but as being prejudiced about it. And of course, this comes quite a bit from the legacies of colonialism, which have received responses of terrorism, and people generally forget the first part of that history. So they just see the terrorism. And especially after the 2000s, many museums responded to anti-Islamic sentiment by expanding and renovating the collections of Islamic art, 
And I think this is a poor strategy. That is, it functions well for getting money, but it doesn't function well for getting people engaged with the Islamic world because there's very little connection between what people see and what they already think. So part of the problem for me is that if you start a discussion in a negative way or with a negative premise, it's very difficult to get to a positive place because you're assuming that people already have a negative thought. So could you perhaps give me an example of that to better illustrate that idea? If you say, well, many people have misconceptions about Islam um, and they judge it according to authoritarian states today. But historically, there were many great Islamic empires that made very many beautiful things and Islamic art museums can show this beauty and this grandeur. Therefore, we should invest in them. Therefore, people should go to them. And to me, the danger of that is that people will go to the museum and they'll say, wow, this is just beautiful. Too bad they're terrorists now, right? There's no connection between the past and the present. But more problematic to me is that you're starting with this negative. For me, the important part is you need to get people completely away from what they think they know. And you need to awaken something which opens them to learning. And that thing that you need to awaken is curiosity. So the question is not how are people entering, but how does the process of entering awaken their curiosity? Because once you have curiosity, you can do a lot. But if people aren't invested through curiosity, then they're not going to get any new messages. So how can we awaken that curiosity? That's the main question. And for me, the, the way, best way of doing this, the way museums traditionally do this is by showing pretty things. But pretty things don't necessarily lead to thinking about culture. There are several other ways of doing it. One of them is music. One of them is food. And I think all of these sensory aspects need to be part of museums. They need to be part of teaching. You have to physically be invested in pleasure in a very non-Kantian way in order to get the curiosity through which you want to understand how your pleasure is happening. What's going on? Who invented this? Why is it like this? How is it connected? And so on. But even better than that, and especially if one wants to connect this pleasure to this entity we think of as Islam, we need to express how this is Islamic. That is, if you are eating baklava and you're claiming this is Islamic, somebody's going to be like, it's sweet. Muslims may have made it, but I don't see how this is connected to Islam. And that's a fair thing. But the way in which one experiences Islam isn't through direct theological texts. It's generally not through, these are the five pillars of Islam and I am bringing them to fruition. So this is correct. It isn't through this thing called Islamic law. People don't spend their lives in courts. They don't do it in the modern world. They don't do it in the ancient world. Nobody spends their life in a court. People then now spend their lives storytelling. That is, people spend their lives in creative media. For us, those creative medias are songs, there are movies. And in the Islamic world, those creative media were often poetry. And this poetry was very connected to the realm of the Quran and the Hadith, which was also very much part of people's sensual world, because people are listening to the Quran as a beautiful text. And they're also exchanging poetry. Now, when I say poetry, because we tend not to pay a lot of attention to poetry in the contemporary world, people might misunderstand that. Poetry is where poetry and stories is where a lot of fun stuff is happening. These are fun stories that people exchanged because they were entertaining. They have to do with falling in love. They have to do with getting drunk. They have to do with going crazy. Um, they have to do with meetings between people. And these stories were very consciously used as teaching stories. These are um, parables, but a lot of them, you know, use a lot of the same things to affect people as our modern movies. So for me, when I'm teaching, I often start out by telling a story 
And when you hear the story, you're not going to think, oh, I must pray. You're going to laugh. You're going to be shocked. So sometimes people are really shocked because in the contemporary world, we are really prudish talking about sexuality in a way that isn't true of medieval Islamic poetry. So I can embarrass the classroom by talking about medieval Islamic poetry. So you can raise curiosity by using the same stories that were used in the 12th century, in the 15th century, and thinking about the culture that people were living in. And then you can think about how is this connecting to Islam? And then you can think about how is this connecting to a beautiful pot or a pattern or a painting or baklava. But for me, it's really the story and the storytelling that needs to come to the foreground. And then once you have a story, what that story does is it kicks out the absence in what people didn't know that people are worried about and which might be an empty space in which they can have prejudice, right? Prejudice is just a way you fill in not knowing. And then you have a story and you're like, wait, that story is utterly different than what I expected. And the second you have the story is completely different from what I expected, that is curiosity. Once you have curiosity, then you can really think about how objects, poems, music, food, how it all makes meaning, trees, because we're not really talking about a culture in which the created world and the creative world are separate from the, what we call nature. We're thinking about a way of engaging with the world that isn't separate, but it's together with all of this, these texts and all of these experiences and all of these rituals that make up a huge and varying thing that is Islamic. So, Wendy, how can we then develop the format in which we have been presenting and perhaps delivering art history? Do you have any thoughts on this in particular? Well, I mean, I really liked how you said earlier this tradition that we are developing. Because tradition is often thought of as being towards the past, but there was a philosopher in the early 20th century whose name was Henri Bergson, who had an idea that tradition shouldn't be reflecting the past, but it should be reflecting the collective spirit. And so there are these multiple ways of thinking about tradition, um, not just as backwards looking, but also as forwards looking. Now, if we take institutions that are designed to uh, make art part of the public sphere, like say the museum, I think we have a huge problem, which is that museums do two things. They store things and they show things. Storage can be deeply problematic. They store way more things than they can ever show. It's um, actually very costly to take care of those things, but you also don't want to get rid of them. That is, they have multiple kinds of value and they also have values that we don't necessarily know what their value will be in the future. At the same time, they depend on people walking through them as a way of getting knowledge. And the thing is, that's a technology of the 19th century. It goes with world fairs, it goes with expositions. And in the 21st century, we have the internet. I think in light of that, museums need to think a lot about um, the interactive capacity of the internet in relation to museum exhibits. I think people need to think about uh, there are a lot of, of course, informational um, things, webinars, and so on. I personally would like to see a lot of short form um, cartoons, because I think those work really well with kids and with young adults um, that you see on the internet, you know, TikTok videos. One needs to really think about what kind of formats are people engaging with, and how can they see that not as something weird that grownups do, but something that actually interacts with them. And I think that's a challenge generally for history or for philosophy and things like that. And so uh, we need to think about how academics can do more public facing work. That is, I think it's really important to write for magazines and that's something that's degraded in um, a lot of academic practice or it's, you know, doesn't really count towards your success as such. It's even people who think, well, it's public, it's not serious research. Um, but I think we also need to think about how we just shouldn't just be producing, you know, these high level academic texts for other academics to read, 
but we also need to think about how we can produce pub public facing work that uses new technologies that um, really articulates things in short ways that can be used. And I think this is particularly important. And I think that people in the humanities similarly need to think not just about content, but about form and how these forms interface with contemporary practices that people are likely to see in the real world. I think this is a wonderful way to conclude, in, which is to emphasize and to highlight the importance of art history as a transformative uh, process and as a way to engage with our current tradition, a tradition that is ours and which we are creating and being participant. For me, I think one of the things that's exciting about art history that maybe we haven't talked about is that when you encounter things from different times and places, you're encountering an entirely different way of being in the world. And that's pretty exciting. That's something that people get by thinking about science fiction, right? That's something that people get through thinking about fantasy and games of thrones and whatever. And the people who are making these kinds of fantasy and fiction, that's what they're building on is these artistic legacies. So I think we need to think about how we can interact with the materials, attractive materials from the past. I'm just gonna get rid of the word art. How we can we interact with attractive materials from the past, not simply to know the past, but also to expand our minds and think about ways of being in the world that go beyond what we know. And that might be art making, that might be, um, writing stories and so on. For me, what's important isn't simply the accuracy of our relationship with the past, but our willingness to let the things that we don't know become part of what you call the tradition that we're developing. Thank you so much, Wendy. It has been wonderful to discuss this topic with you. And I think still art history is a subject that has loads of things to be still debated and has been wonderful to learn more about your perspective on museums, on how we as a society construct these elements and these narratives and how we actually can address them. And I think I stay with your last words, which is that sometimes accuracy is not the most essential part of it, but the stories that we develop and that we generate out of it and how we engage. So thank you so much. Thank for, you. Uh, this is a great opportunity. I love what you're doing, doing that. But this is really where everything plays out. Well, thank you, Wendy. It has been really illustrative material, the one that we you have shared with us today. So I do hope that we have the chance to meet sometime soon in the future. Hopefully one day when you come to London and Asia House opens its doors to the public, that will be lovely. Thank you. You know, I'm very happy you're doing this. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how it works out. Yeah, that would be great to spend time. And of course, thank you to all of you who listen to us regularly. We look forward to sharing more content with you in the upcoming weeks. And until then, we hope that you stay well, you stay safe, and taking care of yourself. You were listening to the Converging Paths podcast. <laughs>